Hello, my name is Stephanie Babs. I'm working at NATO headquarters as NATO's Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Public Diplomacy in a rather big uh, division which is called Public Diplomacy. I've been doing um, this job for about 10 plus years, not always on, on this uh, current level, um, but uh, ever since uh, 2006 I'm working on the senior post and thus I'm responsible in a nutshell for NATO's overall global communications. I'm German by nationality. Um, I have studied both in Germany and in the United States uh, with a particular specialty or background on Russian studies. That was some mm -hmm. years ago. But I always wanted to become part of a multilateral organization in order to uh, see a little bit inside the box and at least make a contribution to shape political decision making. Yeah. So let's start with your personal point of view. What does we mean for you? Well, I've read one more time the We Manifesto <laughs> and all of the key principles are certainly principles I can 100% identify myself with. Uh, when it comes to collaboration, participation, creativity, openness, uh, uh, defending uh, freedom of expression and um, the right to assemble peacefully, all these things are certainly very, very important, not only for my own life, but also for the way I work here in this uh, transatlantic alliance. When, when did you experience such a wee moment? It's a wee moment uh, is certainly a very, I have a very strong recollection of a wee moment on 9-11. Uh, when we all sit here in this house watching like the rest of the world, uh, these terrifying events in New York and uh, Washington and elsewhere, the terrorist attacks on the United States, and there was very spontaneously this very strong we moment. I mean, colleagues from other member countries uh, came out of their offices, we all assembled jointly and we expressed spontaneously solidarity, sympathy and support to our American colleagues. And there was this very, very strong moment of um, collectivity, partnership, friendship, feeling with each other, being basically on, on one boat, if I can say so. Uh, and that actually then resonated even with the political decision making because it was the day after 9-11 that NATO for the very, very first time in its history um, evoked Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, which is uh, the Allies' commitment to collective defense. Mm. What does mm. we means for the NATO? How would you, you define know, if the I, we? Um, well, I think we, the we philosophy um, is in fact quite nicely reflected in the very, very rationale of the Transatlantic Alliance, because we are talking about an organization of 28 like-minded democratic countries who are committed to defend in a joint, collaborative, participatory way uh, in order to make a contribution to make this life better uh, and more secure. Uh, we are talking about 28 like-minded countries uh, who are very much committed to defending their joint values, democratic values. So it's all the we values that we're actually talking about. We are talking about a transatlantic alliance who is very much connected to other countries, other organizations, other players, uh, NGOs, um, civil society, uh, which is very much plucked in uh, in mm. the, the rest of the world. Um, and that's, I think, another we expression. I mean, we being part of a broader endeavor. Yeah, I was just going to say, so you nicely described the we of the NATO, but how does this NATO fit into this greater we? I mean, there is yeah. at least some parts in the world which are outside need NATO. How is the, the smaller NATO mm -hmm. we within this, this greater we? How would you describe this? Well, there was certainly a time, um, and that lasted until the end of the Cold War, when the we at NATO was a very exclusive we, because it was very much a we focused on the, at then time, 16 allies only, and at their world, and at their, the way they, they operated together. But this has all changed, because we have become so interconnected, and the world has become so, so terribly, uh, and in a positive but also in a less positive sense globalized. So yes, NATO has started ever since the past 20 years to reach out to other countries, um, to connect itself to other organizations and we have now really a web of networks in which we play a part, we make or try to make a contribution, to make a valuable contribution, but we certainly don't look at our we 
as the exclusive we, as the one, as the we that others should follow that is uh, a type of monopoly in security and defense, knowing that there are so many other players out there. So you were just describing actually already the kind of changes the NATO was, was living through the last couple of years. What were the major points after the Cold War ended? When NATO's some kind of tipping points, if you could mention I'm, them. I mean, the first tipping point in another we, in a, in a larger, newer we, if I can say so, were certainly the decision of the Allies right after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall to reach out to former en enemies, uh, to former Warsaw Pact member countries, uh, to countries in the Balkans. So it was, in fact, the late Secretary General Manfred Werner, a German guy, who was courageous enough and visionary enough to say, okay, we have to actually um, make that move. And so ultimately that decisive moment ended up in NATO um, adhering and admitting new countries. So we have become larger, that I think is the first immediate expression of that. We used to be 16, now we are 28, 28 mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. And there are more countries standing in line to become a member of this club. Um, the second, and I just alluded to that a bit, is that we have really, really tried our very best in order to build that web of partners. We used to start with partner countries uh, in Central Asia, or in Eastern Europe, um, in uh, the Balkan region, that expressed in one way or the other an interest to do business with us in security and defense. But it was, I guess, 10 years after the end of the Cold War, that we decided that that can't be the end, neither the political end state nor the geographical end state. So we started to make offers to countries in Northern Africa or in the Mediterranean. We started to make offers uh, to, Gulf st to Gulf countries. And all that resulted in building a new partnership with uh, what we call now our Mediterranean Dialogue countries and with some four Gulf countries, Kuwait, Qatar, Oman, uh, the United Arab Emirates. There are now frequent guests and collaborators with us mm. at this uh, stage. And the third strand of a renewed we, if I can say so, is certainly the recognition of the Allies that they just can't stand by if they see in their immediate neighborhood um, countries turning into civil war, countries uh, really becoming problems in security and defense related issues or even failed states like Afghanistan. That was a difficult decision for us. It was not an easy decision for the Allies to decide that they would go out of area. Mm. But the first time you know that, well, we decided to go out of area uh, was um, following the events um, in Bosnia-Herzegovina and then right after in, in uh, Kosovo. And ever since there, this principal decision of trying to make a contribution together with other international players, in particular the United Nations, uh, has been taken and we are we in a, in a larger context. So you were just mentioning actually the United Nations. Mm. I had this question in mind yeah. while you were talking. I mean, United Nations is regarding the memberships, regarding the countries which are kind of unified there, much bigger than NATO is. Could you imagine that NATO is becoming as big as the UN in, with mm -hmm. its task? Mm -hmm. Could there be, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, this, 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 uh, these entities mm -hmm. uh, during the Cold War, they just disappeared. I mean, yeah. and everybody is talking about global governance, everybody is mm -hmm. talking about, you know, that we are getting mm -hmm. closer and somehow have to find on a meta level uh, common, global commons. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of role could NATO play in there? Well, first of all, we don't have at this stage our stakeholders, the Allies. They don't have any ambition to turn this organization into a second type of parallel United Nations. Yeah. Primarily also because the United Nations serves multiple purposes. I mean, yes, it yeah. has a very important purpose in terms of trying to maintain peace and security, but it has many, many other functions right. alike. Whereas NATO is, humbly speaking, only an organization geared towards protecting territories and population and, and, and asking co uh, the countries and their governments to collaborate on security and defense related issues. So our mandate is much more focused, much smaller, 
and uh, so there is no competition or no even. No, I wasn't talking in, in, in competition hmm. ways, hmm. but in in a in an outlook in hmm. a kind of vision. Maybe hmm. it could you know to achieve world peace hmm. might be nice to have a world NATO with a new well, name, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's difficult to predict, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to make any predictions. Um, yeah. But I can already see now that a in the international security arena, there is a growing appetite to have countries who are capable to make a contribution in terms of sending troops, in terms of making available resources, in terms mm -hmm. of making available uh, civil experts for any type of peacekeeping, state building, uh, disaster relief, you name it. Yeah. Um, and I don't see. Uh, that countries on this globe right now, especially given the current financial and economic crisis, have the capability and perhaps also the political will in order to live up to that need. So there is a growing gap between what the world demands on one hand and what nations and organizations, including the United Nations, on the other hand can actually come up with, can mm. give, can provide in terms of support. And we see that, um, or we have seen that in the past, because it was the United Nations knocking on NATO's door various times, saying, I mean, can you please make a um, operational contribution to, for instance, fighting piracy? <laughs> can you please make a contribution and send um, trainers, specialists, or even forces in support of helping the Afghan government? So it was not us saying, oh, we're just sitting around and looking for new ideas, and, and what else possibly can we do? Meaningfully, so there is this growing demand out there, and yet I don't think that the international community, it's the right. governments, have really um, developed the right recipes and have the right resources and capabilities at hand in order to make that really uh, to, to meet that challenge. Yeah. So let's talk about another kind of we. NATO is always challenging. Mm -hmm. I mean, if troops go into a country, NATO troops, how can you build? the we within this country, talking mm. about Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. What, you know, how is NATO challenged to build there this we and mm. what is it practically doing to achieve it? Well, I think the Balkan uh, wars, if I can say so, and our operations in the Balkans have certainly taught us some lessons. Um, and the lessons I try, I mean, we, I hope at least, I mean, we have come to learn. And one of those lessons is that you can possibly just send men, primarily men, and a few women in uniform into a given country uh, without having made uh, proper arrangements, having made proper preparations in order to liaise with the government, the stakeholders, the, the civil society, and, and you name it. So you would need to have in every military operation a component, which is rather a civil military component. You need to have specialists who know how to liaise and work with NGOs uh, you know, uh, you need to have uh, specialists who know how to um, build confidence and trust and a certain relationship with the local population. Um, so we've tried to make this much better when we went into Afghanistan and as we went along within that uh, operations, I think we have come a little bit better on reinforcing that civil component. Um, if you'd ask colleagues, if you'd ask nations in the alliance right now, I think everybody would say that there is no conflict that would require a military solution only. So a military solution, a military operation can only be part of a wider we solution. And if you think that through, that in turn implies that we need to do any type of planning for any given operation jointly with civilians, jointly with other international organizations, jointly with partners, jointly with NGOs and not all rush into the operational theater, as we say, into the given country and discover, oops, I mean, there are many others out there and we don't know how to collaborate with them, work meaningfully and usefully with them. So I think that's a lesson learned um, and we've tried to hopefully make better next time around. How far are you, do you think, on this path? At the very beginning, honestly. I, uh, I there is the realization, there is yeah. the urgency that there is need for it. Absolutely, and um, we have also come a little bit further in the sense that we have really enhanced our contacts in a systematic way with NGOs, for instance. They are frequent, not only visitors uh, to NATO headquarters, I mean, we really collaborate with them 
in the given country, but also they come here to NATO headquarters for various working meetings and we will discuss very openly and very freely the next step uh, in a given operation. Uh, the same is true for our partner countries. Um, look again at Afghanistan. I mean, uh, its neighbours have a stake in Afghanistan, so it makes very good sense and all of this sit down with the neighbouring countries. We haven't actually talked yet with Iran, but with the other neighbouring countries mm -hmm. uh, to discuss their role in stabilization and construction in Afghanistan. So we have mm -hmm. done that uh, much more systematically on the working level as well as on the political level. We have also um, improved our training for troops. Um, training for troops to be deployed in theater all get now a very, very um, strong uh, lesson, quote unquote, on civil military relations. They even get training on the United Nations Security Council resolution 1325, which talks about how to treat women and protect women and children in a given operational theater. All that wasn't was the case some 10 years ago or even some five years ago. So it's a rather recent development, yet I think it's a very important development to which all allies have signed up to. Actually, in the background, we do have a photo of you and uh, uh, Minister of Women in Afghanistan. I think this, if you are willing to give us this wee story, I would really appreciate Yeah, that's it. a wee story which really, really matters to me and it's very, very close to my heart because the woman behind is Palvasha. Her name is Palvasha Kakar um, and she happens to be the Deputy Minister for Women Affairs in Afghanistan. She um, has a background like many women in her country. She had to flee the Taliban invasion and civil war and ended up in a Pakistani refugee camp. Uh, even though she had a very good education as a medical doctor, she wasn't able to return to her country only after the Taliban were besieged. So um, she has courage enough and still a strong belief that she and her collaborator, women, can make a difference for the fate of women and children in Afghanistan. And I tremendously admire her work and her courage. We um, got to know each other at a conference uh, some time ago in Tallinn and ever since we have not only become friends and remained in a very close uh, contact but I've also invited her a few times to, to Brussels uh, and I try to support her in any way I can possibly do um, to make her case, uh, to tell her story and to tell the international community and the world that we can't possibly give up on the women and children in Afghanistan. We can't possibly compromise their rights and what the little that they have achieved in the past 10 years. What about the women in the NATO? <laughs> Isn't that another challenge? <laughs> yes, that's I hate to another. ask you, but yeah. <laughs> you were just, you know. Yeah. That's certainly another challenge. Well, it's another we again. Isn't it's it? another we, and uh, from the outset, people might think that NATO and women. They, don't, they can't possibly and logically connect because we are very much um, a male's place, a military place. But also that has changed in the past 10-15 years because we have more and more women uh, who have, um, uh, have um, gained an excellent education, um, be it in journalism, in social science, in uh, engineering, in, in many, many um, academic disciplines, including in security and defense. And they have come to conquer the market for jobs. And I think they're rightly, uh, they're on the right track and they should do so. So um, NATO has adopted a policy of gender diversity and equality some couple of years ago, which is obviously a very important step. Yet it will certainly take some time before more women, young women including, can be recruited uh, by NATO uh, and at the same time also make a career in NATO. Mm -hmm. If you look at the hierarchy right now, you see that there are lots of young, talented women running around here and most of them work in support of uh, middle managers, senior managers, but there are very few women who have actually made it all the way up to the top, where actually they can make a difference in decision making. Mm. So, how would you describe the biggest challenges the NATO is facing in the near future? Well, there are always two big uh, challenges, at least I would identify two. I mean, there is first of all a challenge for the Allies to stick to what they have agreed to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and this is not a new challenge, but again, it's a challenge for the Allies. And I'm saying this because it was only in November last year, at uh, the last summit, that the Allies, the 28 Allies, agreed jointly on a new strategic concept, which is an important activity, or was an important activity, in the sense that we tried to lay down on a piece of paper what the Alliance role should be in the next 10 years from now. And there are a lot of expectations, a lot of uh, commitments uh, being labeled and described in this document to which we now need to live up. That requires political will and that requires political leadership in order to not just say, okay, I signed this paper and I turn around, but, but now really we need to live up to it. And there's one particular area that I would like to point out, and that is about uh, defense spending. I know it's not very popular and not very easy to make that plea, um, but this house, this organization, is only credible as it have, if it has capabilities, as it has a mean to act. Now, many nations have promised to make a contribution in their own national defense spending uh, up to a certain ceiling, but they have all failed. They, most of them have failed to, to live up to what they actually promised, what they committed themselves to. And so we are running more and more into problems of having the right capabilities. i give you an example one more time, just to illustrate that. Um, if you need to, um, um, if you want to bring um, disaster relief goods, stuff, uh, support stuff, uh, from A to B, from A to Africa, you need to have strategic transport aircraft. Well, um, there was um, a long time, it was a long time ago that the Allies agreed to develop more strategic transport, uh, but that hasn't been really a very successful activity. So, so we are lacking, would, yeah, we are lacking that particular capability and a sense that we need more of that. We can't only have, to simplify that, one aircraft on which we all rely, we need to have a fleet of strategic uh, transport aircraft. And there are many, many other examples uh, that illustrates the need for the Allies to, if they can't spend more money on defense, but at least then to spend more multinationally, to put their money jointly in a pot and agree yeah. on joint programs. So that's a challenge for us, a very, very concrete challenge. And the other challenge, uh, which is probably of a larger strategic nature, of a bigger strategic nature, um, is a bit linked to the question that you posed to me about how, you know, how are uh, international organizations affected by globalization in a, uh, in, in a general sense. And if I look at um, the more recent roller coasting activities, especially on the financial markets, I'm, 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 I think that's a very serious um, development and I'm very concerned because we haven't actually had, ever since the end of the Second World War, countries that have risked to become bankrupt, literally bankrupt. Um, and that again poses a huge challenge to any <coughs> political leadership. Uh, that poses a huge challenge to international organizations, not only to the European Union, but also to an organization such as NATO. And it's almost like a tectonic <laughs> shift in, in, um, in paradigmas, in developments, in, in, in the entire international system, which is very, very hard to predict. Um, so it's not only about markets, it's also about governance and it's about institutions, it's about organizations and in as much as they are really, really capable of finding a smart and creative way um, to bring back some stability to the international system. And that's something that we also watch, obviously, very carefully. I think this is it. Oh, one more question. The very last one is how would you define, you were using this expression a couple of times, political leadership. Mm -hmm. What is it for you? <laughs> political leadership, well, political leadership is, um, well, has become, I guess, um, a very scare good nowadays. But in my, in my view, it has to do with not only developing a vision, not a, not a plan, not a party program, but a vision for how you want to take your country, how you want to take a certain uh, entity, could even be an organization. 
And that vision would need to be not only expressed, you would need to enroll people, you would need to excite people, you would need to collaborate with people, you would need to generate something that Max Weber called followership, real followership. You'd need eventually to take risks, eventually you need to take very unpopular decisions. That all depends on the respective context, on the situation. But a true leader is for me um, somebody that I can trust, that is credible, uh, which is on solid democratic grounds, uh, which is not scared to take a risk, um, and which really seeks for change. Um, and if I look around, I actually I can't find many of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great ending. <laughs> so I don't have to ask this question. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. <laughs>